before uh, presentation mark or done? Yep, yes we are, we're here. Uh, okay, firstly, I'll talk about our, our business use case. Okay. Yeah, we are trying to bring up the stream. Okay. Yeah, we can see the PowerPoint. And this is our, our business model. We entities have changed the business model to collaboration model like uh, the figure below. We call this model B2B2X model. Uh, we provide, entities provide uh, middle business player, uh, for example, service provider, and service provide, middle service business player provide um, end user uh, their services combined with our services. And we regard edge cloud um technology as one of the key technology for this business model it will be uh, will be effective not only for creating new services uh, and but also saving some traffic in core network and code code platform could be one of the candidates of edge cloud platform and we uh, as this figure, we provide each cloud platform include for location space and dark fiber like dark fiber and server and VM and container platform to middle business player. And the uh, middle business player provide end user their uh, content cache, uh, their services like content cache platform and for IoT platform or security platform and so on. And uh, this, okay. um, so we're seeing the pleasant view, but I guess they can still see it, so I guess it's okay. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Okay, this, this is a um, um, brief uh, reference. We have uh, about uh, 5,000 central office and uh, 100 regional office. And uh, in cloud service model, there, there is a service function and data store in the cloud common server and, uh, and computing the and in edge computing service model, there is some data store and function on the edge computing device. We will put the both uh, function and data store in the central office or regional office. It's so I guess the key takeaway of the last two slides is that intention entities intention is that they want to use it not only at the very edge data center but also at the sort of like a telco data center type, not the hyperscale cloud, but the regional office kind of thing. That's one thing. And another thing is that they intend to use it not only for their workload, but they want to make code into a platform that they want to pass it out to the third parties. I guess that's the slightly difference from the APTs. So um, architecturally, that makes sense to me. Uh, I guess uh, from the point of view of implementation, I think that you had mentioned uh, off topic that uh, you're considering some uh, third party uh, uh, path providers like AWS. Um, so my, my question would be uh, the, the, the edge uh, platform uh, and the regional platform, would they be as a part of the same AWS uh, infrastructure, or they, are they going to be like a hybrid of uh, AWS for Edge uh, and uh, uh, your own uh, uh, cluster for uh, regional? Uh, have you guys thought about the physical layout of the system? 
the reason I ask is um, the question of um, the viability uh, of a container-based system or a VM-based system is actually pretty neutral. Um, uh, it's always going to boil down to numbers like uh, latency, uh, accessibility, you know, the number of uh, H nodes that you have, especially for CDNs and stuff like that. Um, uh, the, the architecture itself, in my view, is uh, vanilla enough uh, to be implemented uh, both as a traditional uh, uh, applications, non-namespaced uh, non non applications, non-containerized applications, uh, as well as container-based applications. Obviously, there are advantages of using container-based applications, especially around packaging, uh, where you have a self-contained application with its dependencies as containers. Uh, so in terms of deployment, in terms of scaling, uh, you do obviously get a lot of advantages that most of us know. Um, but I think uh, in your case, uh, the big differentiator would be um, uh, stuff like latency, uh, uh, high availability, and accessibility. So uh, I think, again, Tetsuro, you mentioned that this is targeted uh, for the Japanese market, for now at least, with a possible future expansion to other markets. Um, the big question in that case would be high availability and latency. Because if you're planning on expanding, then um, you need to, uh, well, is the content going to be the same uh, in all the regions? Uh, is the content going to be different? Then in that case, you don't have to worry about having multiple clusters that are isolated from each other. There are a few very, very specific uh, infrastructure implementation details that need to be hashed out before we can say that uh, this would be the perfect solution. I, but I think at least from the application's point of view, I think there are, uh, very obvious advantages of using a container-based uh, platform uh, as opposed to a VM. I, I don't think there's a, there's a question about that. I would be curious to know if, if you have any questions or concerns around security um, or, uh, or availability or anything like that for container-based systems. Do you guys have any concerns or something like that? We were sort of wondering whether we should go into the discussion at this point or walk through the thing then. Have sure, the yeah, yeah. So, do you prefer? Yeah. A anyway, you guys prefer, yeah. yeah. And um, this is uh, the reference slide. Uh, this is whole, our whole challenge. We are going to uh, make all product, uh, all hardware and software with uh, open source. So we now we have three challenges, and one is white box on ORT, and uh, the second is IPv6 networking, and the third is H Cloud service platform. And uh, I think this IPv6 networking is uh, have some influence to H Cloud service platform. And this is tentative schedule. We have three targets. Uh, one is called build in this November, and the second is uh, NTT internal forum in Japan. It's um, next. January and uh, and third target is Open Networking Summit in next April. We will um, do some presentation and uh, probably um, demo in this uh, summit. So this is summary. Our initial target is called Build in November, and we start. We already started testing some use cases with uh, Core 3.0 platform, uh, which is based, I, I, I think, with my understanding, which is based on VM platform. And uh, one of the candidate use cases is content ca caching, and in which we will use Quill product, which architecture is also based on VM platform. But uh, so, 
As of now, existing service applications are based on VM, but if in future code platform is going to support native container-based platform, we will like to understand their benefits and applicable use case from the domain. Are there some other questions? Do you, do you want to let Quill folks talk first, yeah. or do you want to have some oh, okay. discussion at this point? Okay, Mark, can, can you talk about your Quill product and the architecture? So who, who should have the presentation, like Mark or Dan? Um, uh, Dan, pass it to Dan, please. Dan, yeah. Dan. Dan Sahar? Yeah. yeah. Can you share the slide, your slide? Yeah, I'll share it. I, I got it. it. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Quilt, um, we're a startup company based out of uh, Redwood City in California, um, where uh, with we're creating solutions for content delivery um, that run on the edge cloud at the edge of uh, service provider networks. Um, so the, our platform is essentially a combination of, of two uh, major elements. Um, one is shown here in the middle of the slide. It's called QC. Um, this is essentially um, a layer that provides API services and management services for uh, the edge the edge caches that um, are installed in the service provider network. So QC is um, a cloud hosted entity. Uh, it typically would not reside on uh, on the core infrastructure, but rather would be um, the global API for that infrastructure. And uh, the second element, which uh, does install uh, on top of cores, is what you see at the bottom of the slide um, as QN. And this is software uh, caching nodes that can be uh, run as uh, bare metal or, or VM and, and uh, shortly down the road as containers as well, and uh, perform uh, edge caching functions. Now, uh, our platform is designed so that it's able to um, create a universal delivery layer for uh, the entire set of content uh, that, that consumers may, uh, may watch. So this can be both service provider content that you see here on the left-hand side on, on, uh, in green, um, as well as third-party content, uh, typically known as over-the-top content that can come from uh, either commercial CDNs or, or uh, over-the-top content providers. And this uh, would be both for uh, HTTPS content as well as for, for HTTP content, leveraging the, the API layer. Uh, now, just to give you a sense of how this fits uh, in, into the, the cord architecture at very high level, the idea is that um, on the edge cloud, we would uh, you, the service providers would install um, our edge our QN nodes shown here as, as content delivery, and um, we would have a global API that would be able to basically delegate traffic into those nodes, assuming there is um, a content provider that uh, wants to leverage the the resources at the edge cloud. And, in, and this would, would be orchestrated, the, the content delivery function in the edge cloud would be orchestrated by uh, the entire Cord framework, uh, which uh, I'm just, for simplicity, I'm just showing it as Cord orchestration, but obviously there is, there is more, uh, more elements to, to that. Um, the main value proposition around this are, um, I, as was mentioned earlier on the call, it's about leveraging the the huge assets that service providers have in terms of uh, the ultimate latency or, or the lowest latency possible to the users. Uh, we're targeting typically um, 
sub 20 milliseconds in terms of where the deploy where quill deployments are of, of our software and additionally there's um there's benefits in terms of scaling the entire um, network infrastructure that by by localizing the delivery of the content you're able to um basically remove any redundancy of of trans of, of video and, and media transmission from uh data paths that are that are northbound of where uh where the nodes where the edge nodes are actually installed so just a question here so i don't know scott i think you were on the line we already have a, a we're working there work someone's working with a partner about cdns as an nfv onto the court environment so it deploys NFE and that that NFE I believe is VM based. So are we looking at this as here's yet an NF, another NFV that play that can be deployed by XOS into the court environment? I'm trying to understand the relationship there and then understand the relationship to um, a container orchestration system such as like Kubernetes or Swarm. Uh, yeah, David, I'm here, and you're right. Our current uh, CDN solution, it's from Akamai, and it does currently run in VMs, not containers. I don't know if there's any immediate immediate move to change that, so it'd be interesting to see it from a container perspective. Yeah, this is where it's interesting also to say, you know, is there a common API in terms of deployment of the NFE that kind of make these swappable, right, or easily changeable in terms of the capability? So I, I, I'd be interested to see how you see, you know, you talk about it can work alongside a core. Do you, do you Quilt, see this as an NFE that deploys, is deployed by XOS and orchestrated by XOS, but it runs in a container versus a VM or? Yeah, we've done, we've done installs. Um, so our current support is, is, as a VM, is as a VM in uh, what we call an open caching VNF. And we've done uh, those types of installs in, core environments with with uh, several uh, service providers. Um, container is something that, you know, we look at it as just like a different form factor, like at least from our perspective as an application, as a different form factor, which we currently still do not support, but it's, we've had uh, requests from several operators to do so, and we see it as, a, I would say, a natural evolution of, um, of, our, of our product uh, set. Okay, and, and for the deployments you've done alongside Cord, was did Cord orchestration orchestrate the deployment of of your service, or was it kind of Cord was installed and you manually installed your capability? And how, if so, how how did they get hooked up? I guess chained into the existing chains. So um, I I can give you like one example where we were orchestrated by in that example it was Open Nebula was used uh, in their cores uh, pod and it was orchestrating our our edge nodes our our QN nodes the the QC is, was not as I said earlier was is not um, orchestrated by core that runs in the cloud. Okay. So in terms of core, they're, they're kind of separate today. Are you looking to build an XOS service that represents your CDN? An XOS? Uh, so I think we, we actually did a couple, we did at least one replacement where Akamai was installed um, as, uh, as an NFC and we, they were swapped out and, and we were put in their place. So um, I think on that front, it's it's very interchangeable. And I think you can have uh, either more than one uh, CDN VNF uh, or um, just something I'll show in the next in the next slide is um, our um, I would say one of the key differences in our platform compared to a commercial CDN like Akamai, which is um, where Part of, of um, a architecture known as open caching, where the idea is that uh, there can be um, ingestion of content that can come from a, a variety of sources, including commercial CDNs, rather than be tied to like one particular commercial CDN that not necessarily would have 
the super set of content. Okay. I was, sorry, I didn't want to disrupt too much. I was trying, I'm trying to get my head around um, the relationship between what you guys have been building and, and have cord and how that relates to kind of the work that container brigades moving forward. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the nodes like that, that are installed uh, within the service provider network and um, basically Quilt has over 100 service provider deployments of our edge caching ar architecture. Um, one of the um, one of the functionalities that they provide is they act as either uh, a CDN node, like for a service provider's own content, uh, as well as for open caching. And we've uh, helped start a consortium called the Streaming Video Alliance about two years ago. Um, and uh, under the that umbrella, we we share a, a working group called Open Caching which created this this architecture and then you can see this is a, a press release from uh, from CES earlier this year where um, there are several service providers and content providers and commercial CDNs that are part of, of this architecture now the idea is that you're you're able to get um, to reflect an API towards third-party CDNs and publishers um, while as an operator, you still maintain uh, full control of how the edge resources are used. So essentially, you can have one platform uh, for caching, but it will ingest content from CDNs like Akamai, competitors of Akamai like Limelight and Level 3, and, uh, and large uh, content providers, assuming those, there is um, uh, collaboration with, with those entities. So rather than have uh, a different uh, NFB instance like for Akamai, Limelight, Level 3, and and Facebook and Netflix, you have one resource at your disposal that is able to uh, openly um, serve all their content at the same time. And 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 for that, um, this is just like a very high level diagram of of how this architecture looks like. Um, there are basically four entities in this in this architecture, which is uh, from left to right, like the user, the edge nodes in Quilt terminology, in uh, SVA terminology, they're called OCNs, Open Cache uh, Nodes, uh, QC, which is uh, called Open Cache Controllers, and then the delegating entity, which is the CDN. And um, the flow in order to, uh, we, we basically expect uh, an architecture that has um, four key APIs. One is service provisioning, which is basically um, letting uh, the content ecosystem um, have uh, uh, a glimpse into what are the resources that are uh, opened up by the service providers for content delivery. There, there uh, is an uh, agreed upon SLA and uh, a delivery service configuration. So think about somebody like Akamai Let's say they have a customer NBA.com that that they typically uh, deliver traffic on their behalf. That in this case, if if there is a service provider that has uh, open caching nodes installed, Akamai would be able to delegate the delivery of NBA.com into that uh, service provider's open caching nodes. Um, the method by which that occurs is uh, request routing, which typically would be um, done using uh, HTTP redirection, both for HTTPS as well as for HTTP. Um, there would be, there's a logging API that basically allows uh, the delegating entity, the CDN, to receive uh, delivery logs of uh, the transactions that were delivered by this layer. And finally, uh, content management API that allows the delegating entity to um, create either pre-population of content or uh, invalidation and purging of content. So this is an architecture that uh, we've been working on with uh, other luminaries in the, the content delivery industry, like I would say three out of the top four CDNs in the business, uh, main, uh, probably the largest uh, live streaming uh, company in North America, which is uh, uh, Major League Baseball Advanced Media and many others. So, so this is something that we see as, you know, if, um, if CORD is about creating like open interfaces for uh, 
for service providers, this is more uh, of a means to do that on uh, the specific content delivery application side. Any questions on this, on, on open caching and, and um, um, how this how this runs inside like the, the course framework? Um, yeah, so uh, I don't know if this, was the, which this would be the right forum, but I am curious uh, as to what the um, uh, VNF that you implemented as a VM in Corp, uh, what, the, what, what its responsibility is, uh, what, what, what it actually does, because it seems to me that uh, the actual cache is a different cluster. Um, the, there's this API management, uh, layer like you say, um, uh, and then uh, this, this VNF. So it feels like the only purpose of uh, VNF would be uh, uh, some sort of uh, a router, uh, basically routing protocol. Um, can you elaborate on what, what, what the VNF do? So the VNF is in, uh, Think about it like a cache is typically in this and a CDN cache is um, is essentially a proxy server. But um, in terms of an installation, it's a server node. Um, one of I would say the the main use cases for orchestration in this case um, are for for live events. So uh, if you have on demand content, uh, typically you would want to maintain uh, the VNF up as it it has to store content and, and have it reused uh, multiple times by consumers in, in that, um, I would say, geographic or subscriber area. However, in a live, live events are typically events that are, um, you know, they last a short amount of time, relatively speaking, and when they're done, you can uh, relinquish the resources back, uh, back to the system. So we see this as, um, you could say like there's one flavor, even though it's the same software, but there would be one flavor of, let's call it uh, VOD type um, open cache nodes that would uh, that would be almost persistent. They would stay uh, alive for a very long time, and then there would be these um, more short-lived uh, live instances that you can bring up when the when there are flash crowd events or other, or other like um, high, high demand, short lived events that you would um, spin up and then um, uh, tear down once the event is over. I see. Okay. okay, thank you. Sure. Any additional questions? Uh, not, not at Menlo, at least. All right, well, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. So, do you want to? Is, is there any Uh, NGT, do you have any more, anything else to present? Um, no, no more content. And, uh, yeah, that, yeah that, that's all for. I think uh, there was this one question on uh, the, the, uh, the direction in which COD is going um, when it comes to um, container orchestration. Um, David, do you want to talk about that? I mean, I, I can give my opinion. I, I mean, basically, there we're still trying to decide some of what's going to happen with the container brigade and what that means to containerize um, cord. And right. but basically, one of the, the, from my opinion, the premises, uh, the components of cord should be able to run under any container orchestration system, Kubernetes, Meso, Swarm and add value to it. In other words, if a container management system or orchestration system has a capability, Cord should strive to leverage it and not um, 
implement kind of a parallel system. So I think that's one of the, the major themes from the core brigade from my perspective is, is how can we take advantage of these uh, container orchestration systems so that we as a open source project write less code and leverage what's there. And that, that is both in terms of um, starting and stopping our software system as well and managing the life cycle of our software system as well as managing the life cycle of VNFs. Now, there is some constraints around that, that perhaps VNFs have to be a container themselves, although um, there's been some looking, you know, we've looked also into how do we bridge between a container world and a VM world, so we could potentially still have a mixed kind of hybrid environment. So I think that, from again, from my perspective, that's where I see the container brigade, brigade kind of driving things. and really raising questions around can we do this should we do that and then having that work fold back into the main mainline development yeah um so uh, I, I would also be curious to know if uh, the quill team itself has any specific set of requirements that that they'd like to see before they are comfortable enough to containerize their vnf Um, I don't think we have any anything um, unique. Um, I would say caching is typically a, a more storage intensive application than probably a lot of the other um, the other uh, network functions that you would be looking at. That would that could be like the the one um, differentiator um, that maybe you have to to assess like what that, what that means in terms of um, of container management, but we've, um, you know, there's there's people in our, in our ecosystem that have uh, have used uh, Kubernetes uh, specifically and have done that uh, without have have done that migration without too much trouble. So I don't think that we have anything um, uh, wise to say about uh, about specific requirements. Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, in in general. Um, um, David was being pretty open, but uh, in in one of our, our pretty uh, previous calls, uh, at least for as a part of a reference implementation, uh, we have decided to go ahead with Kubernetes for now. Uh, so it's really good to know uh, that um, uh, you you your, your ecosystem has experimented with Kubernetes and uh, has been able to bridge. Um, uh, your requirements for caching over to Kubernetes. Uh, it does have a lot of storage plugins that will let you do uh, caching at various levels. Um, <clears throat> to add to what uh, David was talking about, um, one of the things that we at Menlo are trying to uh, focus on uh, for the next release of Cord, there's one upcoming release of Cord, uh, but there's going to be another release in a few months. Um, and for that, uh, the focus, especially around containerization, would be uh, on the uh, overlay network portion. Uh, what we are trying to do is we are trying to see if we can have a single overlay network uh, that interfaces with uh, uh, Kubernetes, potentially with uh, Docker Swarm, uh, while also uh, interfacing with the uh, uh, traditional system that we have right now around OpenStack. <clears throat> so something like a hybrid system. So that, that kind of makes transition uh, transitioning from a VM-based system to uh, a, a container-based system a lot less stressful, at least in, in my opinion. Um, uh, <clears throat> we don't yet know what the major challenges of that would be. Uh, that's a part of the investigation that's going on right now. Uh, but that is kind of the um, uh, holy grail that we are trying to target right now. Um, apart from that, the, there have been a couple of discussions around um, um, uh, <clears throat> unikernel uh, kind of um, uh, VM definitions uh, that that being championed specifically by the Docker team, um, uh, which will allow for a lot more efficient and potentially a lot more secure, um, lot more secure VMs. <clears throat> uh, that is the other uh, potential effort. We we have uh, a Jira um, um, project. Uh, uh, that, for instance, you could add to um, if you would like. 
<clears throat> or even contribute to if you if you can spare the resources um and we are we are basically uh, following the um pre, uh, following these uh, jira tasks based on the priorities that are set uh, that are decided as a group that's where we are at so uh, the summary is that at the end of <clears throat> at the end of uh, the next release we hope to have uh, some sort of an integration of um, <clears throat> Kubernetes into Cord uh, for at least part of the orchestration. Uh, <clears throat> there is also one more open source uh, effort um, where uh, the OpenStack control uh, services, not the OpenStack VMs itself, but the control services of OpenStack that controls the VMs, they have been containerized. So as we move along towards containerization of um, uh, the Kubernetes, uh, sorry, the uh, COD platform, uh, we hope to adopt uh, uh, the OpenStack services as containers that will make the COD build system uh, a, a little more streamlined. So these are uh, kind of the top line items that we are working on over the next few months. Can you talk a little, a little bit on your mentioned that single overlay interval, what do you mean by that? So right now, uh, VTN uh, is the uh, network, um, the overlay network that is being used in COD um, that provides the IPs for the VMs that, that enables routing between uh, the VNFs and uh, the VMs. <clears throat> um, for in, in, in the case of Kubernetes and also Mesosphere and a couple of other uh, orchestration, uh, container orchestration frameworks, uh, there is also this concept of an overlay network but they require that uh, you implement uh, a specific uh, set of standards called the CNI, Container Networking Interface. Uh, it's an open standard. Um, and when a software overlay network like VTN implements that CNI, it can be used as a network plugin in Kubernetes. And Kubernetes uses this as uh, its network platform. Uh, and that means that potentially the services uh, that run as containers in Kubernetes uh, are on the same network as the services that are running in COD today, the VMs that are running in COD today. So they'll be basically siblings of each other. So uh, uh, to, to be more specific, my goal uh, is to implement CNI for VTN uh, as a reference implementation um, and uh, uh, and ensure that it works with Kubernetes as an overlay network, <clears throat> which could lead to a, more, uh, a further potential of swapping out VTN as uh, the overlay network for COD itself and swap in something like um, Flannel or Weave uh, or one of the other uh, open source overlay networks that is currently being used by, uh, by Kubernetes, uh, swap that into, into COD and see if we can use that as the overlay network in, in core. So basically make uh, the networking, uh, the network overlay networking framework in core as a, as a plugin framework. That's what we're trying to uh, see, but that's a long-term vision. But for now, uh, the plan is to implement CNI in VTN. So CNI functionality, what is the uh, it's uh, similar to the uh, networking app uh, on in ONOS that that programs the network. Yeah, that's my understanding. It's an interface to allow VTN to receive basically information about which containers and which ports are and what the stitches through. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, ONOS uses Neutron to to program the network. Um, so in the case of Kubernetes, uh, there is this uh, there is a, there's this another component called the container runtime. Uh, which programs the network uh, and says I need, for instance, uh, a route from this IP to this IP or from this container to this container. So that comes from the container runtime. Um, and uh, in order to be able to communicate with the container runtime, you need to implement the CNI in the overlay network as a plugin, uh, as a plugin into Kubernetes. Um, so the caveat here is I'm still researching uh, if that is the only requirement or if there are any other additional requirements. At this stage, it just looks like CNI is the only thing that needs to be done. Uh, and I'm, I'm preparing a document, uh, an architectural document on what that would look like. 
but for the um, ne for the foreseeable future, for the next few months, that's that's the plan. Being able to use VTN as an overlay network in Kubernetes. Even to some time in the future, let's say we have a full cluster to host VMs and containers, then the, whatever you one overlay you mentioned will be the abstraction layer of hiding the difference between the neutron and the yes. DNA. That's the plan, yeah. And I don't think this is uh, uh, this is any uh, anything earth shattering. I think most of the overlay networks, uh, uh, at least some of the open source ones, are uh, are implemented in such a way that they don't differentiate between a VM based system or a container based system. Um, so I think it, this is going to be more of an evolutionary uh, step uh, in VTM rather than a revolutionary step. Um, uh, if there are no questions, uh, I, I would like to hand over the presentation rights to David and his team. Uh, All right. Because David uh, has something uh, really exciting to talk about. Well, I hope it's really exciting. <laughs> I think it is. Yeah. All right. Okay, over to you, David. All right. We're gonna. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit. And then I'm going to move it to one of my teammates who will run part of it as well. Hopefully, you can see my uh, screen right now, the slide presentation. Yeah, yeah right. we can see. So just a few slides, because I know slides aren't as exciting as real work. Um, so the focus of the work that we did is we looked, we kind of took a step back from CORD and said, OK, what are some key aspects of CORD that we want to uh, investigate? And how would we redo those, if you will, or, or implement those if we were trying to take advantage of a container management system or orchestration system like Kubernetes? And part of the requirements, again, is availability, fast recover or high availability, leverage redundant compute resources, so essentially keep the same physical pod we have today, and then leverage Kubernetes. We also look to decentralize um, the network programming. So instead of kind of have a single flow that's kind of orchestrating everything uh, like like it's reading a recipe we thought could we look at some reactive programming of the network so that we can um, decentralize in, in the storage of it if you will and go stateless in some areas just because those type of services do provide a, a higher availability and stability of a dynamic system so we started to play around with some ideas there and we'll talk about one of those components which is key to this a little bit later and then we really wanted to focus on capabilities, not frameworks, which means what can we build to add cap value in terms of the core story, but not, um, but build as little as possible. <laughs> it's really kind of where we focus. So what we're gonna demonstrate today is really bringing up a, a VCPE with a data customer. And this is gonna be a full pod, which means we're gonna see, uh, a device behind an OLT going through the fabric to a VCPE running on the compute nodes and then out to the internet. And then once we've established that connection and we're showing that you know we have connectivity to the internet, we're going to reboot the compute node on which the VCPE is running and watch Kubernetes fail over that VCPE to a new compute node, start it up, and then our reactive programming on the network or on the in the cluster relink up the connectivity to the OLT and see the video and, and internet frequency or internet traffic flow again. So that is in short what we're, we're looking to show. Um, we've shown it before internally. Uh, and we're hoping it works again today. Um, the network, always important. This is a standard cord pod, which means we're running the leaf spine fabric controlled by instance of Onos. We are, have four compute nodes, two compute nodes under each leaf. Um, with the OLT uh, off our leaf as well, and a device sitting behind the OLT. So that is the network. Um, very standard cord stuff here. Before we go into the demo, do we have any questions at this point? All right, let's go to the demo. And if, I don't know if I can have permission to give, uh, I can. Um, I can give him presentation rights, it looks like. I can hand it off when I'm there. So I'm going to hand it off to Mosin. Motion. And did you get the rights? 
see if he are you there <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know like he, might, he might be muted oh well he's sharing so that's good news okay so he's uh they're in Ottawa he, he's in Ottawa a lot of the team is in Ottawa so hey sorry I was on mute that's okay no worries so let me walk you through this so up in the upper left corner we have something called master chord one and so we have a four node cluster with one master of kubernetes master right now and right what we're showing here is we're just uh in a watch statement we're running a kube, kubernetes command kube cuddle get pods wide and the really the point here is to show you what's running on each uh node and what containers are running so you can see we have this container spinetti which is our reactive network programming container. And we'll talk again a little bit more about that as we go through. We've got a visual, visualizer container, which is what gives us the, the green rectangles on the far right. It just kind of visually shows what's running on each compute node. And then we have uh, two things dealing with the fabric, which we have Onos instance, which is a fabric controller, and then uh, fabric config validation, which is really just something that continually updates the fabric config to make sure it's up and running. Now, if we go down, to, we have the, the customer, the, the up on the top customer, which has a ping 8888 prompt, prompted for it. This is the, just, well, he's gonna show us that we can't reach it right now. <laughs> it's great. This just is our host behind the OLT. And you can see we do not have connectivity right now. Um, we also have a, a YouTube video, which is also running on that host, which will show that when, when things hook up, we'll start seeing video. And finally, the other window marked customer, we're just showing you that we have an interface uh, with no IP address. And what happens is when the VCP is connected and created, it will get that interface and it'll work. So what we have right now is another Kubernetes command prompt, which is Kubernetes create uh, the VCPE. This is just a standard Kubernetes deployment file creating the, VC, the VCP service. And when he hits that, you'll see both in terms of the visualization on the far right, as well as the textual visualization on the far left, that the VCPE container will be created. Um, before I go on, before he hits return, is that kind of clear what we're trying to do here? Yep. I'll take that as a yes. So, <laughs> okay. Um, go ahead, give it a shot and we'll see if it works. So you can see, on cord two, the VCP is created and it's there. And now what we're really waiting for is the host to finish its DHCP request of the interface. Okay, let's see if it, so now we've seen a DHCP request, it's come through, it now has an IP address. We look at the network, we have it, it's all happy-go-lucky and we have the ping and we're actually getting network traffic at this point. So, um, what do you, if we, uh, do we have to pause and pause the YouTube video or is it just catching up? We've had some, a little bit of network issues out of Ottawa today, so. All right. Doesn't want to. I don't know. You're trying to refresh that. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll leave. You have to trust us on this one. Is the ping still operating? Yeah. Okay. Um, just pause, unpause it, and see if that kicks it into gear. Oh, something's going on with the, the host. No, that's not good. All right, well, well, he works on that. So what happened is when the VCP was created, there were some, um, what do I want to say, attributes added to the VCP. Those attributes essentially describe how the VCP should be connected to the OLT. The Spinetti container, which we have one instance on each compute node, uh, is monitoring 
for containers that come into existence. And when it sees a container come into existence, it looks at that metadata. And based on that metadata, it will then um, create, uh, I don't want to say VLANs, and it can create VLANs, uh, different, what is it, XVLANs, and there's one other one I can't, uh, on the slide, I don't remember right now. But basically, it tries to create a connection optimized for where the source and the destination are, whether that's on the same leaf, on the same host, or across the, the leaf spine fabric. All right, so this, what he's doing right now is a TCD, TCP dump in the VCP container um, of Ethernet 1. And if the video is flowing, and I'm not sure why it isn't, you can see traffic, video traffic coming there, but for some reason the YouTube video isn't showing. So all those dumps, what we're seeing, that aren't ICPM, well, we got, we'd have to stop the pings to stop the ICMP pings, would be a video. To be honest, it's great fun about live demos. Why isn't it working? We'll have to figure that out later. Well, if um, something can go wrong, it will. <laughs> if, if something can go wrong, it will. Um, do you want to take questions now or later? Uh, we, we can take questions now. The next step that we're going to do is we're actually going to fail over the VCPE by rebooting Cord 2. Okay. And so you'll see that recreated. But if there's questions now, I'm happy to take them now. Yeah, so um, the, the concept of uh, Spinetti is really interesting. It seems like uh, it does a lot of what uh, the Q proxy does. Um, has, uh, has there been any thought on, you know, um, contributing to Q proxy itself to build some of this um, routing capability natively into proxy, Q proxy? Um. I haven't given it thought. Kent, who, who, Kent, who wrote it, I don't know if you've talked, thought about that or not. Um, it's certainly something we can look at. We do yeah. plan to uh, contribute Spinetti to the open source. Uh, the plan right now is uh, next week or the week after, have a presentation on uh, Spinetti, kind of specifically go over what it can do. Right. And then release kind of at, the sa at that same time, release that to open source. So that people can take a look at it, leverage it, and at that point, I think we can be, you know, if it makes sense to put it together with Cube Proxy, um, you know, combine those capabilities, and we can look at it that at that point too. Yeah, it it would be awesome to understand uh, the innards of uh, Spinetti itself. Uh, Cube Proxy uh, uh, has its own. Uh, there are a couple of ways Cube Proxy works, but but we can talk about this later. I know it's really late for you guys. Um, but, but yeah, um, we can, we yep. can talk about that, about that in a separate meeting. Yep. Yeah. And I, I did, I thought it, I think Spinetti needs enough time to go over the details to, um, it, it, it needed a separate meeting, not just this meeting. It, it couldn't sure. do it justice. Is that running as a daemon set, Kubernetes daemon set? Yes, it is. Yep. Awesome. All right. Any other questions? Other than why our cat video isn't working? So David, I assume that you said this was a cord pod, but I assume there's no XOS involvement at this point? At this point, all that is installed is base uh, Kubernetes, and then we run our, our containers. There's nothing else. So, so if you were to ask me where I saw XOS, pod. pardon? I was gonna say it's, it's cord hardware pod, but not necessarily a cord software pod. It, yeah, that's correct. So when I think about, you know, where kind of how this would work with XOS, you know, I kind of think um, when we created the VCPE, we, you know, we, we invoked a kube, kube cuddle command to create the deployment, the VCPE. I kind of would envision an orchestrator, you know, whether that's XOS or whatever, to say, okay, I'm going to gather the, the, attributes that I need to create the VCP in terms of customer specific attributes. And then I'm going to call into the container management system to create the instance. And when that VCP spins up, then we'd get reactive programming. So that's kind of where, if you'd ask me today where I see that, that's not like authoritative anyway, that's just kind of where I see things going. Um, because then we can leverage Kubernetes in terms of scheduling um, where we schedule a VCP and which compute node. 
Yeah, that sounds a lot like the uh, how the BSG synchronizer works. It kind of examines the data model, finds the customer attributes, S tags, C tags, et cetera, and then uh, orchestrates the container. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting because it, you know, it, getting rid of OpenStack and um, trying to figure out where Kubernetes will fit into XOS. Uh, it's almost like in this scenario that that XOS doesn't necessarily need to know about Kubernetes at all. Um, just the VSG needed to know about Kubernetes. Well, even the VSG doesn't really know about it. Kubernetes starts the VSG container. There's nothing special, Kubernetes special about that. It's just we've added attributes to the container that Spinetti, who does know Kubernetes, can read. I see. So it's a Spinetti API you use then. Well, there's the, the VCP actually doesn't call anything. It's it's passive in that respect. It just starts up. Spinetti notices because it's monitoring Kubernetes. It says, "Oh, look, someone started a container. Let me look for well-known attributes on that container." It's actually and, monitoring. So, sorry, it's it's actually monitoring um, Docker. So it's independent okay. of Kubernetes. You could run it on any Docker-based container system. Yeah, and it would work. Thank you. Yeah, that's yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, thanks. But, that that helps. Yeah. So we're we're independent of that. Does that make sense? I think so. Yeah. So this way, a VNF in theory, a VNF could be built independent of everything. You do. We use XOS or something to say, hey, create this VNF or create the set of VNFs, and augment those containers with attributes that kind of describe the connectivity. And I think when we go into a longer talk on Spinetti. Kent can actually talk about how he's looked at chaining with Spinetti. And then as those containers come into existence, Spinetti grabs those attributes off them and creates the network, creates the chaining. So the, the thing that's nice about here is, is, and we'll, is we have kind of that stateless system, if you will, or states on the VNFs. And then we're operating on that. Hey, our cat video seems to be coming up. That that kind of makes sense to everybody. Yeah, yeah, it it, it does. Uh, and uh, I can also already see ways in which Spinetti will be will help with uh, uh, bringing uh, a common overlay network in court. This is awesome. Yep. Yep. All right. If there's not if there's no other questions now that cat video is showing, and we also have the TCP dump, you can see the video is going over that. Are there any questions or should we reboot cord two? All right, let's reboot cord two. So this is not simulating a hardware failure. We're, well, <laughs> we're bringing down cord two on which the VCP is running. And you'll see both in the upper left and upper right as those uh, new containers are created and old containers are recognized as no longer available. So you saw that. We've already created the new VCP. It's already on um, the other compute node. And pretty soon what we should see is the ping restored. Is the ping command still running? Can you scroll to the bottom of that window, the ping window? There you go, the ping is restored. I thought it was restored. I saw the, the thing moving. So we're pinging again, and our video is continuing to show. So that was how fast the VCP failed over when we rebooted, essentially unplugged cord two. You'll notice that uh, in Kubernetes, it sees two containers on cord two. They're really in the kind of unknown state. Um, is that how they're called? Oh, yeah. So you can see that the VCP is in the unknown state in the far left. And basically what happens is Kubernetes knows there were containers out there. It can no longer communicate with that node. And so it's, it doesn't quite know what's going on. When that second node fully reboots and comes online, what you'll see is Kubernetes talks to the, the manager on that node, if you not the not the Kubernetes manager, but the agent on that node. And it will mark those two containers as gone and it'll restart a Spinetti container because we need that on our on that cord node, but the VCP container will be gone. But what you can see again is the pings flowing 
I don't know why we're having network troubles to YouTube. I'm going to blame CNIT because packets are flowing. It's whatever's going there. But you saw that how fast that failed over. And so that was a true hardware failure with connectivity through a pond, recovered fairly quickly. And so again, when the new VCP was created on cord one, Spinetti found out about it, reconnected the things up, and that's what caused traffic to flow again. Make sense? Questions? Um, do, do you have any uh, metrics on how this compares with uh, the VCP being in a VM? You mean in terms, terms of throughput? In terms of throughput and in terms of recovery? Um, we don't have any metrics in, in terms of throughput. We haven't done that. Uh, to my knowledge, if I were to do this in the existing cord pod, and Scott, you can correct me, would the VCP be recreated on a new instance? What would happen if I reboot the, the uh, okay, yes, get rid of the cat. If I rebooted uh, the compute node with a VCP on today, what happens? Um, nothing happened, so you would have no connectivity. So we, we've not implemented the component that watches for things to fail and then uh, takes action based on that. So it, it's, it's not a fair comparison today. Um, we could do a throughput comparison, but um, we haven't yet. Uh, presumably, I mean, today what happens is you have the VM and inside the VM you have a container. So unless the VM layer improves network performance to a container, I would guess that we're getting about the same throughput. Right, right. Um, this is probably uh, something on a, in the minds of a few people. Uh, do, do you anticipate any uh, security issues with having your VCP in a, uh, in a container as opposed to a VM? Uh, no, I don't. Um, but I'm funny that way. Um, <laughs> yes. So as we, we would have to do a full security sweep on this, to be honest, just like we'd have to do a full security sweep on, on uh, any VCP in, in cord proper today to figure out what's going on. Um, again, one thing we have to be careful of, I think, when we start running containers is best practices around using users in the container, not letting them go as root, right? Um, create those type of things. And I don't think, and even our own internal containers, we're not as um, good at that as we should be, you know, following all the best container security practices. And those are documented and out there, and I think we need to, to better follow them. But I, I don't really have any concerns about them today. Uh, as we get to the the, uh, the unikernel stuff, that might be interesting too, just as from a security perspective. Right. Any other questions? Yeah, so how are you specifying what the network connectivity should be? Um, you know, like, you know, how, how does data get from the OLT into the VSD and how does it get from the VSD out to the internet? I'm assuming that's uh, in your deployment YAML file, but yep. Can we can we show that deployment YAML file on the cord master? Let's see what the mouse is. Yeah. So you can see. Um, the open network graph, the S tags and the C tags specified. Is that the only tag, Kent? That's the only tag on this container. Um, we're not doing chaining, so the second tag we have isn't in play. The, oh, which one, the uh, deep, no. The, the, the other one is just the a link, link yeah. tag, yeah. So yeah. that's how it that's how it's hooking up. Okay, and, and is the fabric configured the same way as it is traditionally? Yeah, it is. Um, the we're not, only the only go ahead. We're we're not running vRouter or oh. um, the VTN app. 
So, so all we're running is segment routing, and we aren't dynamically creating the VLANs in the fabric. Um, this is not updating ONOS for the fabric. So we've essentially created the VLAN on LEAF1 for this. Just That's one of the next things we'll do is we'll dynamically up the fabric, update the fabric with the VLAN information for, this, for the customer when it comes online. We expect to do that reactively as well. So how did that work in terms of failover when you fell over from one computer to another? So there's a couple things here. Let's go. If let me, can you pass me back the the presentation because then we go to caveats because <laughs> there's always caveats. Um, all right. Do I have it now? No, I don't. I don't. I think you have to pass it back to me. There we go. Thank you. So. We go to the caveats. So right now, I've, the VLAN for this specific OLT is not dynamically created. It is across compute node one and, one and two. Um, so what you saw is a failover from compute node two to compute node one. We were using Kubernetes capabilities to um, specify affinity. So we controlled it from, well, we, we gave it, um, we said you could only move between nodes that were attached to leaf one. So we controlled it that way, right? We don't control which one, we say only nodes on leaf one. The reason we did that is because, again, to my knowledge, I, I could not create a VLAN across a compute node from, um, not a compute node, I could not create a VLAN from the OLT coming in port 129 in leaf one across the leaf spine to a compute node under leaf two. Yeah, I couldn't. Right now. Yeah. yeah, so I could not do that. So we, we had to restrict movement of this VCPE onto where I could actually create a viable VLAN. And so that was compute node one and two. Um, and again, that was if we had more compute nodes on the same leaf, it could have moved to any one of those. It just had to be on leaf one. Um, once that restriction's off on the fabric, then yeah, we can move to any compute node anywhere. There's still a philosophical question of, do we want affinity to have the VCPE actually on the same leaf as the OLT to minimize latency? But again, you, we can use Kubernetes in its scheduling affinities and rules to help manage that. The thing we wanna do is also use reactive programming though to update the configuration and create those VLANs dynamically. We just didn't do it for this demo. Um, so that when a VCP is created with the special tags, we can use that those same tags to say, okay, now let's set up VLAN from one port to another. And we'll have is to do that. that. Is that within the scope of Spinetti or is that some other component that would do that? We haven't decided how to do that or where to do that. Um, and we, we talked about this earlier in the team is uh, in terms of a microservice environment, we want to have clear boundaries of what does what um, if it makes sense to put it in Spinetti, great, but we don't want Spinetti to become the it does everything container, yeah. right? And so that's one thing we're going to be cautious of as we go forward to say, okay, does this kind of fit in the charter of this container? And if so, great. If not, then it would be another microservice to operate on it. And from my perspective, you know, irrespective of this specific instance, it's perfectly reasonable to have multiple containers trigger off a creation of a container and do kind of, I do this part and we just have to figure out what the proper way to do that is or what the proper uh, separation of work is. That kind of answer which question was? Yeah. Okay. The, the other behind the curtain thing is by default, uh, Kubernetes I think has a five minute um, uh, wait time, timeout or before it actually ex, uh, expels a container. So by default in Kubernetes out of the box, we when we reboot node two, it waits five minutes for node two to reestablish, you know, in case there's a network issue before it decides to fail over and build a new container. So we tuned that using standard tuning capabilities of Kubernetes. And to be honest, depending on a deployment, different operators may tune that differently depending on what they need. We tuned it down six seconds for our purposes, and you saw how fast it actually happened. Um, 
but we just we're using standard knobs to deal with that. And then the, the key to this really is this Spinetti container. And again, I do want to have a longer presentation. And I've asked Ken to put one together for that because he's the author, so all credit to him. And as I said earlier, it creates VLAN, VXLAN, or peer interfaces depending on uh, the, I'm going to say, how near or how I can connect from one endpoint to another. So if they're on the same compute node, we can do peer interfaces. If they're going across the same leaf VLANs, if they're going across leaf spine, it can do VXLANs. And so that's what it can do today. So again, one this reactive programming from my perspective has a lot of benefits, right? It We now have a component that's doing this programming that is essentially is stateless because it's getting the state from the containers, um, which means I can upgrade it, upgrade it independently. I can scale it independently. Um, it gives us a lot of those stability factors that we want in a distributed system. Um, Kent, is there anything else you want to say about Spinetti? I mean, it does do chaining as well as what we saw here with the OLT, and I, I Kent will talk about that later. Um, I don't really have anything to add at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, again, we, we do plan to open source this after, after our talk on it. So, um, any questions? So I guess uh, one uh, one uh, point to note here is that uh, we should be careful about talking about affinity in open forums until you open source it. I don't care. No, it'll be fine. It will be. <laughs> Okay, um, I, I don't I don't think it's an issue right now. Um, yeah, uh, you just until we open source it, the code won't be available. But other than that, I don't think it's an issue. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you. Th thanks for the presentation, guys. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Again, I think it's pretty late for uh, some of the guys uh, on the call. Um, I, I, I'd like to give uh, people the chance to ask any questions right at this stage, if you'd like. Yeah, I, I guess the, the question I have is, um, we kind of seen zero versions from two different sides, right? So, David and Tina team, which are, which are kind of looking at what if we go to this very stripped down containerized environment um, and how can we build code like functionality in, in that kind of environment? And then there's the, the um, kind of goal of how do we fit in Kubernetes or whatever it is into the existing core and build process and do things like bridge open stack VMs and different pointers via VPN or stuff like that. Just kind of approaching it from you know, the existing side mapping and the container stuff. So, um, I guess it's an interesting question for the brigade and for, for the project as a whole is, the, is the, um, you know, how we proceed and how we, how we bring these systems together or do we bring these systems together. Um, so, so in my view, uh, the end goal would be what uh, David and his team are doing, being able to uh, do um, uh, the entire orchestration using uh, a container orchestration system, either Kubernetes or Docker Swarm or whatever you like. Um, the approach that we uh, we are planning to do at ONF is to kind of be the um, midterm uh, solution where uh, we help the tran ease the transition. In the end, uh, um, I think what we will see is that the orc a lot of uh, the heavy lifting that XOS itself is doing will be delegated down to uh, the orchestration systems, uh, container orchestration systems as we go. And eventually, it will probably become um, an easy enough decision to make whether we just keep the system the way it is or we make that a completely vanilla uh, uh, container-based system. I think I think the answer will come to us. At least that's the way I see it. Um, David, do you have an opinion? No, I think that's it. I mean, what, what we showed was kind of where I think we need to go from a container orchestration perspective. I think there's going to be right. further talks with uh, within the TST, the greater TST, as to where does this fit in with 
kind of XOS. Um, so guys, this... Sorry, David. Um, have you guys started mapping what functionality is provided by XOS versus uh, the orchestration? Not yet. Not yet. No. no. That's actually a pretty good idea. Because uh, it would be interesting to see what is or isn't covered. This way we understand where to kind of invest in support, right? So, absolutely. So um, there is ob obviously clarity around what the orchestration systems provide. Um, uh, I personally need to understand uh, the responsibilities of XOS as it stands today. Um, but yeah, we, once we do the mapping, uh, uh, we can we can obviously see the deltas. Uh, but more importantly, implement e even if it means that we are uh, reducing the responsibility of XOS into uh, Kubernetes, it's not going to happen overnight. It's, it's, going, it's going to be, in my view, um, a pretty organic transition, uh, one and feature at a time. And I think, so what it helps us understand is if we agree that this is the direction we want to go with, then it comes down to are these things we want to add to XOS versus, right, start leveraging. Right. Yeah, that, that, that so does make sense. Make that determination. Yeah, yeah, that that that's actually a pretty good point. We should probably add a Jira on that. Um, we should add a Jira to the um, to the uh, to the container project. Um, I personally don't think um, XOS is going to completely go away, given what I know so far. Uh, it it probably will. E Still stay as a very very thin layer on top that that brings up the entire system that's eventually managed by the container system. Um, at least in the next year or so, I don't see this thing completely going away. At least that's the way I look at it. Um, but like I said, the end goal should be a, a system that is natively orchestrated by something like Kubernetes or or, or Docker system. That should be the end goal. Um, and I think we should definitely design systems in such a way that we always debate whether it should go into XOS or a, or a container system. But I don't think it's going to be an overnight thing. I'll add a Jira for that. Yeah, I mean, I think XOS, you know, as, a, as a, you talk about as a service uh, development environment as well as a service um, creation environment, I guess we'll say, you know, those concepts still have to be there, right? What right. Kubernetes does, or any of these orchestration systems do, is it basically takes instructions from a higher level system and creates containers based on those instructions. So that's where I think over time, and I agree it'll be organic, you'll see some changes rather than necessarily the synchronizers doing all the work they're doing now, you'll see some of the synchronizers say, okay, I'm going to uh, create the definition of what I want to create and then pass it off to Kubernetes and Kubernetes will create the containers, and then we might have reactive containers to tie things together. So that's kind of where I see things changing, because I don't expect to, um, again, replace XOS with this. There's always gonna be that system above this layer that says, what am I actually creating? And how am I going, you know, and, and doing the specification of how things will be chained together. Right. But I think that's what we need to be able to paint the picture is, right? Yeah. I mean, what does it provide and what would, the XOS versus how would this fit in? Yeah, absolutely. So if there are no more questions, we can call it a wrap. Um, thanks a lot, guys, for attending. Um, and uh, we will schedule another meeting, uh, hopefully to talk about Spinetti uh, sometime soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank